and welcome to Demystifying Modern Repertoire with Ann Maker. My name is Virginia Shingleton and I'm a volunteer with the National Flute Association. If this is your first time attending an NFA event, then I would like to personally welcome you to this flute community. The NFA was founded in 1972 and has since grown to become one of the world's largest flute organizations with members from all 50 states and countries across the globe. We invite you to visit our website, nfaonline.org, and learn more about us and how you can be involved. We'd also like to acknowledge that today's online event is made possible with support from our members, our donors, and the Illinois Arts Council Agency. Thank you, and now I will hand it over to Ann Maker. Thank you. Thanks to NFA for hosting these events. I think it's such a great project that they're doing. Um, so today I am going to be talking about uh, modern and avant-garde repertoire, and I'm specifically going to be focusing on the more stylistic performance practice aspects of it. So I want to start by just kind of defining what pieces I'm going to be working with, because obviously modern is very broad. You know, it could be anything from the last hundred years, but a lot of stuff that we do quite often, you know, the Prokofiev Sonata, the Poulenc, um, WC Searings, right? These are very familiar, and we can pretty just handily step into them. So when I'm looking at avant-garde pieces or modern works that I'm looking at styles that aren't necessarily based in consonant dissonance tonality. So things that are a little bit more abstract, maybe a little bit more atonal. So um, some examples of this would be like Varese's Density 21.5, Ruth Crawford Seeger's Diaphonic Suite, the works of Toru Takamitsu, John Cage, Arnold Schoenberg, right? These guys that are a little bit more abstract and maybe a less accessible, a little less enjoyable to be listening to and playing to for a lot of people. I mean, I enjoy them quite a bit. I think they're really interesting pieces, but I get that not everybody um, loves this style of music. So within the flute community, we have all of these resources that are aimed at teaching extended techniques. And so that wasn't really a direction I felt like was lacking. And I really wanted to focus on the style of how we play these pieces. Cause I know I, for one, have had experiences where I brought in a modern piece, um, the specific time I'm thinking of, I was working on a piece by Robert Dick after light and I brought it to a lesson with Robert. I did my master's degree with him, studying with him and I thought I had done such a good job, but it just wasn't clicking. And he listened to me play it. And then he said, just listen. And then he played it for me and he did everything on the page, just like I thought I had been doing everything on the page, but his interpretation was completely different. The piece sounded like a brand new piece, totally different from what I was playing. And it was kind of planting the seeds of like how we interpret these pieces is really important. And all of my instincts and like leaning on my privacy, previous experience did not get me there. Like it was not helping me to understand how this piece was put together. And I think this is a really common experience for a lot of students. You know, if you've ever tried to learn you know, density 21.5, and you're like, I just don't get it. It doesn't work. Like, why is it sounding like that? Um, it's not that it's technically so challenging, right? Like flutists, especially student flutists, more than ever have excellent technique. I know my students have wonder, wonderful technique. They are very skillful, but they do struggle with these kinds of pieces for the first time because they just don't get it, right? So everything they've practiced, um, kind of betrays them, like their instincts are not ac super accurate for these styles of pieces. Um, and there are three big reasons why I'm so focused on the 20th century and why teaching these pieces is important. And the biggest one is that it's part of our history as flutists. So we are, as classical flutists, playing a historical and living art form. So we do study all the historical periods, like that's part of any collegiate education is to study music history from the Baroque era to the modern day. And these pieces are part of that. And they're often not studied. They're not played very often. Um, I mean, some of them are like some of them are very important repertoire pieces. But, um, you know, a lot of the intermediate works that could help, you know, develop these styles are 
not super common in the collegiate repertoire. Um, and then the second reason is we get asked to play these pieces. So, you know, the Barrio Sequenza, Fernie Howe's Cassandra's Dream Song, Takamitsu's voice have all been on major competitions. I know Barrio was a NFA Young Artist piece several years back, and Fernie Howe and Takamitsu have showed up on the Kobe competition in recent years. So if these are your first experiences, you know, possibly like the biggest competition you've ever done in your life is the first time you're going to be looking at the Barrio Sequenza or anything in that style. That's like really stressful and also really hard. Like Barrio is a very difficult piece in all aspects, stylistically and technically. And if you don't have any basis for that prior to that moment, um, I imagine that would be a very terrifying experience and not a super great competition experience. And then the third big reason I think these pieces are important is because, as I said, we are in a living art form, right? We are working with composers, their new pieces are being created all the time. And a lot of this music of the avant-garde 20th century is part of composers' education. So I know a lot of collegiate composers, they do study serialism and modernism and post-war modernism and minimalism, you know, all this stuff that we don't have a ton of flute repertoire for and thus we don't interact with as performers as much but having this shared musical knowledge of like of these pieces of these avant-garde styles can really help make these collaborations more fruitful if everybody is kind of speaking the same language because if a composer is expecting that when you say mid-century 20th century pieces they're thinking about Anton Webern but you're thinking about Charles or not Charles Copeland Aaron Copeland um, that's a big gulf. Those pieces are not similar. The styles and how we approach them is very different. So just making sure everybody's on the same page can really help have really fulfilling collaborations. Um, so I would like to go through just a little bit of a chronology of the 20th century so we kind of know what we're talking about. Um, so I have this divided into what was happening in Europe and what was happening in America. So the European music history is probably a little bit more familiar, you know, so the 20th century for us, for flutists, really starts with Impressionism. And this is a place flutists are very comfortable. This is Debussy, right? Uh, we play a lot of Debussy, this would be Ravel, you know, all this stuff. And it it is less tonal, so I do think it's important to include it in the avant-garde styles because it is deliberately breaking with some of the more romantic, big, lush harmonies. Um, there are still these chords, but they're handled differently, right? And then kind of alongside that, we have expressionism, which is a genre that did not produce very much flute music. I'd say the only like really prominent piece is Pierrot Lunaire, which is not really studied in lesson like it's a big chamber piece you might play it you might come across it but it's not part of like flute lessons canon very much um and then from expressionism that kind of grew into the second viennese school which you might remember from your theory classes or your music history classes but again we don't there's not a lot of flute repertoire from these time periods there is a few there are a few small examples um that we can study and look at to kind of get some familiarity with these. And kind of from the second Viennese school, we kind of get into this interwar um, plurality of styles. And if I had to define the 20th century, like its defining moment is just that there was so many different styles, different types of experimentations happening that we really kind of have to take each piece individually to figure out what its priorities are. And I'll be talking about that more once we start talking about pieces. And then, of course, across the pond in America, um, you know, we have some more of the continuation of the Romanticism. And the first big avant-garde movement is the Ultramodernists. And this is the composers Charles Seeger and Ruth Crawford Seeger and Carl Ruggles. And you might have come across Ruth Crawford Seeger. She did write a couple pieces for the flute. Well, I'll be looking at those, one of them in a second. Um, and then again, like in Europe, the interwar, like avant-garde is broad. Like there's a lot of things happening. You know, Aaron Copeland had some like avant-garde atonal experimentations. This is mostly in piano music. Um, but there's also a Virgil Thompson flute sonata for unaccompanied flute that is interesting. The Verez Density 21.5 is from this time period as well, um, a little bit later, but kind of he developed the style in this time. So again, it's this big kind of mesh melting pot of like how 
each individual composer is exploring these ideas. And then after World War II, we have a few big innovations that really changed how composers were thinking about sound. And one of them is the biggest one that we'll be talking about today is the post-war modernist movement. And this was really kind of based out of Webern serialism and the Darmstadt summer courses. And this is where we get pieces like Barrio Sequenza, um, like Takamitsu Voice, um, a little bit later, this is kind of new complexity, Cassandra's Dream Song, Brian Fernie Howe type stuff. So this is like a big complex, like trying to be objective, um, you know, getting away from the big lush harmonies and melodicism of earlier genres, like on purpose. They were avoiding it very deliberately. So I do, let's get into some music because there are some unique challenges to the 20th century. So I'm going to show, demonstrate that with some pieces, but just generally what kind of applies to everything is there are some things about this music that is technically challenging. And then there are some things that are stylistically challenging. And I would say the big technical challenge is rhythm because the, the pulse is often very obscured in a lot of 20th century music, either through like various subdivisions or syncopation or just deliberately like having everything tied over beats in a weird way. Um, so that lack of audible pulse can be really hard when you're first approaching these pieces. And then also the rhythmic complexity can get very complex very fast, right? So we have, you know, these famous scores that look so impossible um, generally because of the rhythms is what is the really stopping point for those. And then stylistically, because we are unfamiliar with these styles, it's often hard to know where the phrases are or to make those decisions about like where to breathe or how to use vibrato. And those are the things that I'm really gonna be focusing on today so much. So with style, with pieces, um, I think we're gonna just get straight into looking at the first score. So the first piece I kind of want to look at is Diaphonic Suite Number 1 for Solo Flute or Oboe by Ruth Crawford Seeger. And this piece is written in 1930 or 1931 by Ruth Crawford, and she is an American composer from before World War II. And that information is really important because in general, um, the way flute was performed was pretty, like, broken down geographically and by time period. So if you are a Baroque person, this should sound very familiar because we do approach Baroque pieces in this way of like, the, the German Baroque is a little different in its ornamentation than the French Baroque or the Italian Baroque. Um, so these are kind of similar. It's not quite that extreme, but in general, American and French pieces have more of a, a French performance style, which will be pretty similar to how we play now. The French style kind of evolved into this international flute style that is very similar, is the basis for the style that we generally use when we're approaching most things today. So like more or less consistent vibrato, um, consistency across the registers, colorful playing, you know, very colorful tone colors, you know, all that stuff. And a big part of that was because of Frances Blaisdell who helped disseminate that in the US. And she is also the premier performer of this particular piece. She premiered the Diaphonic Suite in New York when it was written. So with all that in mind, there's a lot about this piece and the way you play it that will be very intuitive, right? So just looking at this, um, I would be using a very standard vibrato. Like these note values aren't super long, so it won't be like super lush, right? But a delicate shimmer vibrato is very appropriate. When you have longer notes in the second movement, you know, using a musical vibrato with the phrase makes sense and the music works with that. Um, some ways in which this piece is unique that is kind of shifting away from that, you know, our instincts of romantic players is the use of dynamics, the use of rhythm and the phrase lengths. So just looking at this score, the lines are all different lengths. They have these different bar lines. Um, 
it seems kind of abrupt, like this double bar would kind of indicate a phrase ending, but you slur over it, like that's a little unusual. Um, and with this, I like to turn, when I have things like this that don't make sense in the score, I really like to turn to a little bit of research. And I took a very deep dive into this piece. I wrote a performance guide on it during my doctorate. Um, so I've done that research and I can share it with you. So this, Ruth Crawford was very influenced and inspired by prose poetry. So this line organization with the different bar lines and the different line lengths is her translating some of those poetic structure ideas into music. So these lines are very regular. You know, we have five and then four, five and then four, right? So she is using like these patterns in a deliberate way. These bar lines do indicate different types of phrasing. Um, this single heavy bar line at the end of the line is uh, I believe it's a slight period feeling or a slight comma feeling. I'd have to look up the exact wording. And then the double bar line is a more definite period feeling. And then at the end, we have this very heavy, um, it's printed a little badly, but it is a triple bar line. And this would be a definite period feeling, like an ending feeling of the piece. So that is with that, that presents some interesting ways because with poetry, ways of playing, I mean, because with poetry, you know, you don't generally read each line and stop. You read in sentences if it is in sentences with prose poetry. So I think the line breaks really emphasize different moments in the statement. In, and I think that's what she is trying to indicate here. So we have this first idea building on the dotted rhythms. And then this first five tuplet with the crescendo is a big deal. So she put it at the beginning of the line. Right. Um, the second thing that I would be really paying attention to is dynamics and rhythm and like rubato tempo stuff. So first with dynamics, in general, the 20th century will take very literal dynamics. So if you had to have a one hard and fast rule is everything marked in a score, you should do 100% literally as possible. And if it doesn't work, you know, if you get to the point of your performance where you're like trying to figure it out and like doing it and you're like sure that you're doing it 100%, then maybe you would start adjusting things. But your default should be this is piano until it isn't, right? 100% piano until it isn't. And then you do this crescendo. You don't start it early. You don't start it over here. You start it where it's marked to the mezzo forte, stay mezzo forte, and then subito piano again. So taking every marking as a subito marking that you do suddenly when it happens um, will help you kind of wind your way into these pieces. Um, with this being a 1930s piece, obviously it does not have the high degree of notation specificity of some later pieces. We'll look at some so you can kind of see how that changes. But that would be my first thing. Second, she gives us a tempo marking. And then she's pretty deliberate about adding where she wants the rubato and the a tempo. So we have this quarter equals 96, and then a writ here, and an a tempo here, another writ, a tempo. And just in general, with the rhythms and the articulations and everything, she's very specific about it. So that kind of indicates that she wanted this to be very accurate, right? Because, for example, if she did not care so much about the pacing in here she could this line where my mouse is my cursor um, she could just have an a chow over these couple bars to the six tuplet and then a uh, writ until this figure at the end right and that would achieve a similar effect of speeding up and slowing down but instead of like leaving that to performer choice she notated it very carefully and then again the same thing on this line, we move from triplets to sixteenths to the fives and in, in a very deliberate way. Okay. And then moving down, um, we just see more of the same. Um, a big issue with these pieces that like, so looking at this, you can, there are these big slurs over a lot of things. A really common issue is like, how do I know where to breathe? And in general, with a piece like this, you want to start looking for the things that repeat. 
So particularly the second movement, the breathing is very challenging. She has these big slurs over all the phrases. And when you're trying to figure this out and look for how you might work this, um, finding moments that repeat can be really important. And to do that, to start figuring out kind of the motivic structural content of pieces, I really like to encourage students to sing them because we as flutists are not trained singers, right? We're not gonna be super technical about it. We're mostly gonna be singing contours. And a lot of times it's easier to recognize the repetition without our instruments, right? So just looking at this, we have this little three note ascending pattern with the eighth notes. Da, 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 da. That doesn't really come back until this third line. And it's a note lower. Da, 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 da. And the notes are similar, though the rhythm is a little different, but this would be our second phrase, okay? So are there any questions, concerns, anything jumping out to you that you're like, wow, that's really weird. I don't know what I would wanna do with that moment. No, we good? Okay, so let's keep going i'm gonna pull up another piece that kind of builds on these same ideas and that would be takamitsu's air for solo flute so um with air i have the score marked up a little bit air was written by toru takamitsu he is a japanese composer but i would classify him like group him into that kind of post-war international style. And this particular piece was dedicated to RLA Nikolai, which we all know about Nikolai, um, famously studied with Moise, right? And so again, Takamitsu probably has more of that French style of playing in his mind of what he's looking for. So post-World War II, in this kind of post-modernism, um, genre, which does include a lot of Takamitsu's music, even though this piece is much later, um, it's from the 90s, but it's more like those earlier styles. Um, the main differences of how we approach these pieces are just generally to be using a lot less vibrato. Um, and again, to be doing everything very literally. However, the amount of detail in these pieces goes up exponentially following World War II. So just looking at this, there is a dynamic on nearly every single note that is longer than an eighth note, right? So even in this first page, we have pianissimo crescendo, hairpins, 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 like on everything. So in this piece, the dynamics often are very core to how the phrases are shaped. So if you played this with no dynamics, this first line, it would sound extremely different. Like it would not sound, I mean, it would kind of sound like the same melody, but it wouldn't be, have the shape um, and like the motives would be much less noticeable because it is so flattened, right? The dynamics are part of the motivic structure of this piece. So again, this piece was written for Nikolai. He has a very French style. It is sort of in that paired back new music style, so this would indicate less vibrato, but still some expressive judicial vibrato. I would expect a lot of tone colors in this piece, um, not only because it's in that, like kind of anticipating that French, like uh, colorful performance style, but also because Takamitsu notates it. So down here in this line, this a tempo lontano means distantly, and then we also have a harmonic circle on that note. So again, harmonics mean a different color, right? They're not always super different on the flute, but Takamitsu obviously wanted that in this moment. So there is a lot of colorful things notated. So this indicates we should be going for those things quite a bit. We have flutter tongue here, another kind of tone color effect. And then later on in the piece, there are some more flutter, more harmonics. There are some like bispigliando color trills. So these are not different pitches, but they do alter the tone of the note, right? Okay, so for some ways that you will need to 
kind of adjust to learning this piece from just like reading it down like a standard solo flute piece, um, you know, maybe like Ebert or something very familiar, is largely in using less vibrato and being very judicious about it. I would say non-vibrato is much more appropriate in this style than it would be in something like Boza or Ebert, you know, that we're maybe more familiar with. Um, the rhythms are very carefully notated. However, Takamitsu has a circa 54 tempo, and that to me is not always a strong indication that rubato is expected, but I do think it is appropriate in this particular piece because there is so much notated rubato. So he's sort of setting up in this first page, showing you how he thinks the rubato should be used. You have this sostenuto here before an odd tempo. To me, that means the sostenuto should stretch a little bit. And then we have writ, a cell, rallentando, in tempo, writ, on tempo, you know, we have all these changes. And I, I do think the first page is kind of teaching you how he wants the rubato to work in this piece. Because we do, he does um, back off from giving you so many rubato tempo marks. You know, in this section, there's some, this is more in tempo, but it does kind of taper off throughout the piece. Okay. So back to the beginning. Um, while this piece is based on an air, which is a very melodic type of piece, I believe it's an opera piece, I'd have to double check that, but you would think it would be really melodic. And just looking at the beginning, it does look quite melodic. We have this very long phrase here that is, you know, not entirely in one breath, but is a very continuous long idea. However, the way this is treated throughout the piece really kind of demonstrates it's more a series of little motives that are grouped in various ways. So we start with this statement, we have this long note into the sixth tuplet to this high note, and then the scale down. And that is one idea that does appear a few times throughout the piece. And then we have this kind of da 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 da, -da melody, um, and that gets explored as its own individual motive. We have this ascending eighth note da, 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 pattern that also gets explored as an individual motive. And then probably the most important one is the ba, ba, da, da, this one right here, the high note with the lower um, jumps to the A. And this repeats at various pitch levels throughout the piece. And as you kind of scroll down through this piece, it is quite long. Um, and so being thinking about the motives and like where they come from and echoing them and how they group together can really help maintaining the interest of this piece. So for example, we are on into the third page. Oh, sorry. This page, sorry, the second page here. And we it's suddenly much more jumpy. So we have this ba da da. This is sort of echoing that ba ba da da but it, it's a little different. And then you have all these single statements, there's a lot of rest, there's a lot of pauses, and it is very kind of disjunct despite each individual little cell being very melodic, having all this shape with the dynamics. You know, we have this very ba da 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 da, right? So this one figure like is using the dynamics to really show the shape in this way, to show how the different motives are layered. Um, and then one thing I do find very new and unique to the 20th century that is present in this piece is the use of silence and stillness. And I actually think that is possibly the most challenging aspect of this work because Silence is really scary as a performer. When you're standing on stage, just standing there, like waiting for the next thing to happen, that's terrifying. And with my own students, um, with my own performance journey and with my students now, I see that standing there waiting for the next thing or just like letting the silence be heard for a second is really, really hard for them. And I like this piece a lot for learning that skill because Takamitsu hands how the silences should be performed to you. So if you are just starting your 20th century repertoire journey, you are maybe you pick up this piece because you heard it and you loved it and 
but you're feeling awkward in these silences, or maybe you're picking up Verez and feeling awkward in the silences, um, you will have, uh, sorry, click down the chat for a sec. Um, the way the notes finish before the silence can really help you decide how to perform them. So for example, I'm looking at this one. This is kind of the end of the first big section of this piece. We have this huge diminuendo of this note tapering off. It's drifting into silence, right? I would say this is a diminuendo to niente. And then for that silence, do you stand there like a statue? Do you freeze when that note ends and then just kind of take a breath? Da, 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 da. Or do you kind of breathe through it? Maybe you have a little bit more of a relaxation, you know, da, 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 da. You know, like how you do that will change how those silences feel. And you can try different ones until you find one that feels more natural, that works for the piece. And so that's one example, you know, these notes going into silence. And then over here, we have all these very active pauses. Right? So these do have a little taper. Ba da da da. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Ba da da da. Right? Something like that has more of the suspension of motion rather than a relaxation. So, again, how you do that? Do you freeze? Do you move? And with my students, and when I was learning this, I actually decided for every single one I would write in my music freeze or stillness or um, breathe through it, you know, for whatever type I had decided, like through a mirror or through like recording on my phone, I was going to do. And I, I just think being able to watch your video back and trying it until you find the one that seems to work um, is a really valuable way to do this. Okay, so any questions on Takamitsu? We good? Okay, so I do see a question about what kind of things we can do to help our audience when we're presenting a modern piece, because we have to remember as a performer, the audience only gets to hear it once. And I really do think it is our job as performers to help the audience hear these shapes. So, for example, with Takamitsu, um, you know, it is a more abstract piece. It's a very beautiful piece, right? I'd say... I've generally gotten good feedback on it when I'm presenting it for audiences that aren't necessarily musicians. But I think with these types of pieces, we need to highlight the structure and the shapes and like really bring out the things that make these pieces unique and what they're based on when we don't have melody harmony to fall back on. So almost like very similar to when you're playing Baroque pieces, you know, you need to bring out the bass line and show the structure and the repetitions and all that so the audience can follow, especially in unaccompanied pieces like the Bach Partita. Um, you do the same thing with 20th century pieces. And, you know, with the more serial abstract pieces, we're going to look at Barrio Sequenza in a second. Um, some audience just don't super get them but i find by like focusing on the energy and just kind of treating it like anything else like finding what is expressive about that style can really help the audiences get into it so it's like i'm sure we've all heard a competition performance or a student performance of they've been assigned a modern piece and they're not super into it and they don't get it and the performance just like falls flat um I think by digging into this, into the style, into being able to engage with these pieces really confidently can really help with helping audiences get into them really confidently. And of course, not everyone's going to like everything, but um, I've gotten generally pretty good feedback when I've been presenting modern pieces to audiences, though I am a little judicious about which pieces I choose for which concerts. Um, I do try to choose the friendlier ones when I know I'm going to be playing like a free afternoon library concert with a lot of kids or, um, you know, I might save the barrio for, you know, the college flute studio recitals where, you know, they are maybe more interested and prepped to listen to those types of pieces. Okay. 
And with that, let's take a look at Barrio. Cool. So I also see how do you approach teaching younger students to play these pieces, play these rhythms and keep consistent pulse. Yeah, so rhythm is one of the really hard parts of this. I'll let me get this up. So rhythm is actually a huge part of the barrio. Um, again, this isn't a piece for younger students, but the rhythm is a huge deal. So in terms of building consistency with rhythm, um, I kind of view it like any other piece with rhythm. I know here in Texas, we our students do unaccompanied pieces quite often because of the all state, um, all region etudes that they do every year from like seventh or eighth grade going forward. So they do get very used to playing unaccompanied and maintaining their pulse in that way. And I think just having the experience of doing it, um, playing with a metronome, counting with a metronome. I make my students walk around a lot if they're having trouble with pulse um, because their internal pulse is the part that matters. Like the audible pulse of the music is a little less important. So. Um, you know, just kind of how you would teach it for anything, making them count, making them sing subdivisions. A lot of metronome work is really where I start. Um, and then let's get into Barrio because the rhythm here is one of the really difficult aspects of this piece. So with Barrio Sequenza, this is like peak post-war modernism. It is, um, I believe it's a serial piece. I, sorry, I don't remember. The row is not a 12 tone row. So it is a very complex serial row if, if I'm remembering that correctly. And with, but it does have all the styles. So again, this piece was written for Severino Gazzoloni, very famous Italian flutist. And he played this piece, um, not lyrically, but you know, with good flute tone, with vibrato, with like presence the way, you know, we shouldn't be approaching everything. But he also really went for the drama in this piece. So I think the big shift for this piece, so aside from the rhythm, I'll talk about that in a second, the going for the dynamics and the pointillism of this piece. So it is quite choppy, right? There's a lot of space around each figure. The phrases just kind of go and stop. Um, when you get later on into the piece, this gets magnified. So we have these very long notes, especially on the second page, like where do we put our phrases and how do we show that to our audience? Because obviously we need to breathe. So like we're probably breathing here, probably breathing here, probably breathing here. You know, I think I breathed before every fermata if I could get away with it when I did this piece last. Um, but how we group and like what kind of breath we take can really show that these things are together, not that they're separate new ideas, right? Um, but yeah, the pointillism here, bum, bum, ba -dum, bum. Like that's all one idea and you can make it one idea through your performance. Whereas like this might be a breath or this might be a new idea. Um, I think I do consider this part of the previous phrase, looking at it. And in this piece, I mentioned a while back that singing the phrases is really important for like figuring out the flow. And I really think that's magnified in this piece because looking at this, it is so technical. There are so many dynamics. The notes are so fast. Um, let me scroll down to a more difficult part. And I, I'm sorry, this is marked up a lot. This is my performance copy. Um, I marked my original when I was learning this the first time. So like looking here for this line, this is really hard. This is extremely challenging. It's very fast. It's very technical. It has all this grace notes and weird stuff going on with the rhythm. Um, so I like, I like to learn this piece and teach this piece by singing and really all modern repertoire with singing. Because again, by creating this musical image of what you want 
you can practice to that. So if you start this um, and you're trying to learn the technique at the same time as the style, at the same time as the dynamics and their articulation and your interpretation and your interpretation, you are going to learn it, you know, one way while you're just working on notes, right? And then you might decide after that point, it's like, oh, actually, I don't like the way this interpretation is working. I want to do this a different way. And now instead of starting kind of from scratch, you are unlearning the habits you just formed to learn a new way of doing it. So, um, you know, I like to kind of compare that to, you know, we play our scales and stuff in everything. So like when we're learning a French piece, like Chaminade is very based on scales. Um, it's very easy for you to translate scales into various different pieces because we're very good at that. They're very universal patterns and we study them isolated and then we study them in pieces and we get very flexible with adjusting how we're playing them for various contexts. With this, this pattern is weird. Um, if you have practiced this pattern to the fluency that you have with major minor scales, I applaud you because I never would have before looking at this piece, right? So we build up our technique and our skills and our musical interpretation all at once with modern music a lot of the time. And by creating your mental goal of what you want this to sound like without the flute getting in the way, it just saves you a lot of time. So again, I highly recommend vocalizing, right? Because, and then a kind of side note, especially if you're working with like perhaps a younger student, like maybe an undergrad who's doing this piece for the first time, they can get really bogged down in what they are personally capable of in that moment. So, you know, for example, in this first line, they might not go for the Sport Sando's accents because they're cracking. And in them learning to play this without cracking, they are like building repetitions of playing this very moderately instead of full force to the wall, you know, going for every accent up to 11. And that's what you want in this moment. It, you want it to be up to 11, right? Um, so just kind of like taking the context and creating the interpretation away from the flute can really help um, save time and like also that they can actually get to that really intense interpretation. Okay, so I do wanna talk a little bit about the intimidation factor of this piece with the rhythm. And I am aware this is the older version. I, I don't have the more updated version with the traditional notation, unfortunately. I know that one is considered more standard at this point. Um, or I think it's, you know, in my research, it seemed more common, more commonly used. But I prefer playing from this one. And I have added the changes. Like I know there are some slight differences and I have incorporated them into the score. But I did wanna just talk for a second about how I approached the rhythm here. And on the advice of uh, Tara O'Connor, who I had a lesson, a one-off lesson with while I was studying this piece, she had me take a ruler and mark out the quarter divisions, like the 16th note divisions of every beat. So in every big tick, the 70 beat, I have first 16th, second 16th, third 16th marked out so that I could get more accurate with the actual proportions and where these notes were within the beat. So by doing that, I was able to, you know, um, let me find one that's a little bit more complicated. Yeah, so down here, the marks are kind of faint but they are there. So by doing that, I was able to add subdivisions to my metronome. I was able to learn this slowly with subdivisions to kind of like make sure I was accurately learning these relationships. Okay. Um, and I think those are the big things with Barrio. There are a couple extended techniques in Barrio, but mostly just notes and rhythms, right? Um, okay, and I see we're moving forward. I am planning to leave some time for questions. So if you have a question in the chat and I've just been ignoring it, I will go through and address them all after this last piece. So the very last thing, oh, the very last thing I want to talk about, oops, to reset it for a second. Um, is Ian Clark's zoom tube. 
And ZoomTube is not a post-war modernist, really avant-garde piece. It does have a lot of avant-garde elements though. And I really like this piece as kind of a bridge for students to learn about some of the ways they can do things that will be applicable to these later pieces. So from the very beginning, we have this long breath sound. This is not a sound based in melody. There are no notes here, like it is ascending, but it's a timbral sound. And with the dynamics, with um, you know the gradual opening, this is just a timbre effect to really set the scene. So how like students learning how to phrase this and learning how to like lean into the sound effect effectness of it as musical sound is important, right? That's part of learning to play new music and extended technique repertoire. Um, and then with this melody, this is a blues inspired melody. So again, it's more familiar. It's a little safer for students who are coming from more melodic genres, which is all of us. We all start with melody, right? Um, but the phrases are very abrupt, right? Um, and they do take a lot of blues inflections that are not super familiar. So you do get a bit of like learning another style of music, even though we are working within a more tonal, slightly more familiar genre, right? So from the beginning, ba -da -dum -ba -ka -da, ka -da -ka, right? So it, the suspension of silence or of sound, it's, you know, a pausing while you wait for the next thing and bridging over that gap is a good 20th century avant-garde skill to learn. And students can learn it in a piece that is maybe a little bit more fun or a little bit more accessible for them. And he does that all over the place. Um, and then coming down to the fourth page, I believe, we have this section that is entirely based on timbre and rhythm. So this, again, not super melodic, just a quarter tone chromatic run, more or less, but the mouth sounds change, right? So the notes material is just a quarter tone run. It's not super exciting, um, but the dynamics this fortissimo or triple forte to niente, the forte molto dim to niente, the mouth sounds changing is the interesting part. And then these silent, these rests, these silences are very long. So it is a way to really help students get very comfortable with these long pauses. Like two measures at, I think this is quarter note 84, is a really long time to like let that note ring and dissipate before you start the next thing. Okay. So I, I do really like this piece. I think it does incorporate a lot of skills that are really good for teaching this style. But maybe if you have students that aren't, you know, super into it, but you do know that they will want to be doing Takamitsu or Barrio or, you know, these more um, canon 20th century rep pieces, it can be really helpful. Cool. So we have a little bit of time. I see some questions. Um, so does anybody else have questions that they want to add? Um, just kind of going through the chat. I see silence as part of the piece. It's not nothing live in the silence. Yes, silence is inherent to these pieces. Um, the stillness, the silence is so important to understanding and like being able to have both long notes and not playing like rest that are either stillness or motion or, you know, just treating them differently can be, is really important for helping students learn and being comfortable with that idea. Um, we talked about this rhythm. Okay, so when playing a modern piece with accompaniment, how can we help our accompanists to understand these nuances and help bring them out along with us? That's a really great question. Um, I find it's, I've actually had a really hard time finding pianists that are, like as invested in this repertoire and just pianists just are so busy. I I don't know, like the last few years, all, every accompanist I've worked with has just been so busy and so overloaded. So I do think um, it is important that if you are doing like this very challenging avant-garde repertoire, like if you maybe wanted to do the Moderna flute and piano piece, Honey Revs, it's beautiful. It's very cool, pointillistic, like Barrio Sequenza. But I do think you need to have a good relationship established with that pianist and that they are on board with that level of project. 
because if you're just like hiring an accompanist for a flute recital, they, that's not what they're expecting. Um, and it does take a lot more time and preparation on their part to learn and rehearse these pieces with you because they often take much more rehearsal because again, they're not sight readable generally. Um, and they, the ensemble, the back and forth and the rhythms can be much more complex. So, but if you have a piece that is like relatively technically accessible and your pianist just isn't coming with you or is having a hard time, I would really maybe take a rehearsal to kind of sit down and like outline it and treating it a lot more like chamber music or asking them to treat it like chamber music where it's not just strictly accompaniment um, can be really helpful because these pieces are much more chamber-like. And then kind of just as a side note, I've encountered really similar issues with playing Baroque music with pianist. So it's not a modern music specific thing, um, but yeah, just, you know, having them listen to you, maybe match your inflections, um, just asking them to like, can you really go for that accent or can this be much less or, you know, like coaching them through the performance aspects of it a little bit can be, can help a lot and help them get there with you. Okay, uh, one more question. Might we distinguish notation of fermata over a bar line or over a notated rest as the stoppage of forward motion? but silence without a fermata moves through time? That's a good question. And um, my answer is gonna be really unsatisfying because it really depends on the specific piece and really the specific moment. So if you have like a specific piece in mind, um, maybe you, you should try it. Um, I'm trying to remember what pieces I have that would have fermata over rest over like a specific moment. Um, I want to say I just encountered that recently in some Charles Kirkland pieces. Um, I'm looking at one of the sonatines with a student right now. And I want to say he uses that distinction pretty often um, where it is like the fermata over a bar line is more of a pause like a section break versus a fermata over a note is like more rubato um and would have a little bit more motion or stillness you know but yeah the very unsatisfying answer is it really depends on the piece and the specific composer and just how the music is working around those moments but yeah but if you're working on it you should try it all the ways and see which one seems to work best Any other questions? Cool. Um, well, if there's no other questions, I'm just gonna take a moment to pitch my dissertation research. So everything I talked about is stemming from the research I did for my doctoral dissertation at UNT. And I will, um, oh, I don't have the link open, unfortunately, but, uh, It is linked from my website and I'm pulling up the link as we speak. So it, the entire thing is available for free to the public. I just put it in the chat. Um, the dissertation goes through the various historical periods of the 20th century and then does include a very detailed style guide that really goes into the hows and whys of the decisions and the advice I was just giving about these various pieces and then also includes a curriculum that kind of walks through building these skills in a very progressive way. So it's a, a kind of six unit curriculum that builds up um, the various skills Where did it just go? I had to go right here. Um, that builds up these various skills. The first skill, the first unit is early atonality, which is often, you know, a very familiar area for flutists to be. This includes works like W.C. Searings. And then the second unit is rhythmic complexity, because again, rhythm is a huge part of the 20th century, increasing rhythmic complexity. The third unit is um, motivic structures. So 
This would include the Takamitsu, however, my dissertation was very time limited. I didn't go up into the 90s, but you know, using it focuses on pieces like the Hindemith Akshtuke or the Ruth Crawford Seeger, for example, that do kind of use motives in this more disjointed way rather than entire melodies. The fourth unit is musical silence, which again is focused on developing the skill of silence and stillness within music and repertoire. The fifth unit is timbre based phrasing, which again, a characteristic of the 20th century as we moved away from melody, you know, more notated vibrato use, more harmonics use, extended technique uses. And then the last unit is post-war modernism, which is kind of incorporating all of these into these pieces like Barrio Sequenza that have this more uh, stylistic challenge of the pointillism and the spikiness. Cool. All right, well, I think that's all I have. And I'd really like to thank NFA for hosting this lecture, um, this talk. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to email me. I am easily Googleable. My website is public, you know, and of course, NFA has my info as well. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you again to Ann Maker and thank you to everyone who attended today's online event. A recording of this event will be published on the NFA YouTube channel later this week. Our next online event is going to be on October 27th. It's Embracing Change in Midlife with Eva Amsler. To learn more about us, visit our website at nfaonline.org or follow us on NFA Flute on social media. Thank you again.